right, so first section we're going to take a look at is 1.1. So lots of little topics in here. Most of them I think you'll, you'll have seen before. Okay, so we're going to start out by looking at this number diagram. And I'll make a few notes on it as we go. I'm not going to write like, long definitions for everything. Um, but I'll, I'll explain what each one of those numbers says. So when we talk about numbers, there's different kinds of numbers, starting with really, really simple ones, getting to more complicated. So counting numbers, those are the simplest kind of numbers you can have. Uh, they don't include any negatives. They don't include zero. They don't include any fractions or decimals. They start at one, and they go up. And the reason that we need more than counting numbers is because when you get into doing arithmetic, there are certain calculations that could happen where the answer you get is not a counting number. Let's start with an example. Um, how about Caleb? Can you give me uh, give me a counting number? Uh, five. Five. Okay. James, can you give me another counting number? Ten. Ten. Okay. If I do five plus ten, I get fifteen. Is fifteen a counting number? Yes. Yeah, that works fine. Right. Let's change it from addition to subtraction. Five minus ten. Is five minus ten a counting number? No. No. So that's the problem with only learning counting numbers. There are certain calculations that go beyond those numbers that you will need to know. Okay, so in order to be able to do more advanced, I mean not that that's a really advanced calculation, but to be able to do higher calculations, we've got to extend our numbers. So the next extension is whole numbers. And whole numbers, the only difference between whole numbers and counting numbers is there's one new number in whole numbers. Um, does anybody know what that, that new number is? Yeah? Zero. Just zero. That's it. So whole numbers are just like counting numbers, except they start with zero instead of one. Still no negatives, still no fractions or decimals. So we still haven't solved this problem yet. And if we gave that question to somebody in like kindergarten or first grade, they'd probably say, well, you can't do that. We relearned that you can never take away a bigger number from a smaller number. You can't take away more than you have. Well, you can if you understand integers. Okay, so integers now include negative numbers. So like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on. So now we could do 5 minus 10, and the answer would be an integer. It's negative 5. But we could still run into a problem. Can anybody think um, of an operation where you could do something, and the answer would not come out to an integer? Thinking beyond like adding, subtracting, and multiplying. Yeah? 5 divided by 10. 5 divided by 10. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. That's like saying you want to take you know, five, five different objects, and you want to give these five objects equally to 10 people. But you can't do that, because you only have five. The only way to give five objects equally to 10 people is to start breaking these objects into pieces and giving everybody a piece, or in this case, half a piece. So that's what rational numbers are. And I think I wrote that definition down. Nope. So rational numbers, I'm just going to put here fractions and decimals. And for most everyday purposes, I would say rational numbers are about as complicated as of a number you would need. Um, if you are measuring something, it might come out to like 10 and 9 sixteenths. It's not 10, it's not 11. It's in between 10 and 11, so it's a fraction. If you're cooking, right? Maybe you don't need two cups flour, you don't need three cups, you need two and a third. So it's two and then a fraction of the next cup. So rational numbers are basically all the numbers that you can write as fractions um, or decimals. Right? So if rational numbers are the numbers you can write as fraction, irrational numbers would be what then? Eh? 
irrational. Fractions or Numbers that what? So improper fractions would still be rational. Those are still numbers you can write as a fraction. You just can't write as a fraction. That you can't write as a fraction. It's not possible. Anybody think of a number that you can't write as a, as a fraction? Yep. Uh, divided by zero. OK, so 5 divided by 0, that's a calculation we're not even allowed to do in math. So that, that would be like a undefined. So um, it's, it's not something valid you can do in math. You can't divide by 0. So I'm thinking of something you can do, and you get a number. It's just not a fraction. It's a number. Yeah. Um, so if you write 10 divided by 3, that would be rational, because that's a fraction. It's still a fraction. This is a number that cannot be written this way. Yeah? Uh, the square root of 3? Sure, square root of 3. If you take, and you look at what the square root of 3 is, I'll show you how to do it on the calculator. Second square root button is on the left hand side, and 3. You can try really hard, but you're never going to be able to write this as a fraction. And it keeps going past 808. Right? It goes on forever. There's no pattern to the number. It doesn't repeat. Uh, if a decimal starts repeating forever like this, that's different. You can write a repeating decimal as a fraction. Okay? But that's not a repeating decimal. So square roots. And there's another number that we don't know how to write as a fraction. Anybody know what number I'm thinking of? Yeah, pi. Yeah, pi. That's a number you can't write as a fraction. So these numbers are a little more theoretical, not, as you, not used as much by like everyday people. Uh, but in math, they, they definitely come up. Uh, if you've heard of the Pythagorean theorem, square roots come up a lot in that. And pi comes up a lot when you're dealing with certain shapes. Uh, which shape does pi come up a lot with? Not rectangles, it's certain shapes. Yeah. A circle? Yeah, I mean, circle, circles, spheres, cylinders, uh, finding volume, surface area. 3.14 comes up a lot. Okay. Yeah. So now, if you take all the numbers you can write as fractions, the rationals, all the numbers you can't write as fractions, the irrationals, and put them together, those are called the real number system. In Algebra 1, those are the kind of numbers you study, okay, real numbers. There are numbers beyond real numbers, uh, like imaginary complex. We're not going to talk about those right now. We will, but not, not today. All right, and the other way you can think of this number chart is think of these different boxes as like places, starting with a small place and getting bigger. Okay, so think of counting numbers as like Boston, whole numbers as Massachusetts, integers as New England, and rational numbers as um, the United States, okay, getting bigger as you go up. If you are in Massachusetts, are you automatically in New England? Yes. Yes. Now, how about the other way? If you're in New England, are you automatically in Massachusetts? No. 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 So if you are a whole number, you are automatically an integer. But if you're an integer, it doesn't mean you're a whole number. So you can think of it as places, and that's how it works. Some of these number sets um, have symbols that go with them. Uh, these are the three that I know of. So a Z, and they kind of have this extra line in there, and I think that's there so we don't confuse it with a variable. But that Z symbol, uh, that stands for integers. Uh, the Q stands for rational. And the capital R stands for real. Now, I, I kind of understand the, the real symbol one, R, and real begins with R. Um, when you divide two numbers, like something divided by something, does anybody know what the answer is? Whatever you put right over here, what you call that? Like when you add two numbers, you have a sum. Quotient. Yeah, so maybe that's where the Q comes from. I'm just guessing the Q on rational. Uh, but the Z for integers, I'm not, I'm not sure. Now, if you saw something like 
this, and you saw a little plus sign next to the Q, that would mean positive rational number. If you saw a little minus sign up here, that would be negative rational number. And you could put the plus or the minus sign on any of them. How about zero? Positive or negative number? Neutral. Neutral. Neither, yeah. Zero's, zero's even, uh, but it's not positive or negative. Could you just go curl up for a second? We're going to look at a few properties. And to explain these properties, I need to use three different letters. I'm going to use A, B, and C. And the A, the B, and the C can represent any real number you want. So think of them as you know, positives, negatives, fractions, or decimals, or zero. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So let's, let's do it this way. So I'm going to show you the, the example and see if you can remember the name of it. In the first one, we're switching the order that we add two things. It's like 2 plus 5, 5 plus 2, same thing. Does anybody remember what property that's called? Yeah? Is it reflexive? Um, so reflexive is similar. It's when you have the same thing on each oh. side, but it, uh, that one's a little different. That's a good, a good guess. Does anyone else remember? This one begins with a C. Yeah? I thought I had a good No? So think about um, what people do every day when they go from like their house to work. What do you call that? Commuting. You're commuting? That's the commutative property. Yep. So it's when you go back and forth, you change the order of the two things. That also works for multiplication, 2 times 5, 5 times 2. Um, how about this one? The order is exactly the same, A, B, C, A, B, C. But we've changed the parentheses. We've changed the grouping. Does anybody remember what that property is called? Yeah? Is that the symmetric? Uh, so symmetric, that is another property. I don't know if I'm going to talk about it. Uh, in this lesson, but, but that is another property. But no, this one's not, um, not symmetric. You also remember what you call it when you change the grouping. So if you have a group of people that you like talk with regularly, you'd say that those are the people that you, begins with an A, associate with, right? So that's called the associative property. Associative all has to do with how you group things. Okay. Next one's a little tricky, so we're going to do this one in reverse. Um, the identity property is something that you can do in addition to get back what you started with. So can anybody think for addition what you could do, and it would basically give you back exactly what you started with. James? Uh, when it be like a subtracting what you added? Or like subtracting the negative what you added? Or like adding the negative what you added? So I want to do something that would have no effect on my number. Zero. Add zero, yeah. So the identity property for addition is when you add zero. Now for multiplication, would it be multiplied by zero? No, it multiplied by one. Yeah, it's a little different. You multiply by one is what doesn't change it. And distributive property, that one you're probably most familiar with, that's when you take a number that's on the outside of a set of parentheses and you multiply it to what's on the inside. And that only works if the symbol that I just circled is a plus or a minus sign. You would not do distributive property with something like that. You do not do 3 times 4 and then 3 times 5. You do 4 times 5 is 20 and then 20 times 3. Okay, so on page, I think it's page 2, they go through those same properties, kind of like I did, I told you that for the identity property for multiplication, it's times 1. 
So they, they go through that on page two for multiplication. They also show some other properties that I didn't talk about. Okay? They show a property called closure. You don't have to know that. Okay? If it's not one of these properties that's on the board, commutative, associative, identity, distributive, you don't need to know it. Uh, there's another property they show on page two, inverse. Uh, we're not, we, don't, we don't talk about that one. And I think ref somebody mentioned reflexive, symmetric, and there's also transitive. I might skip all three of those. Those are in this section, um, but that just might be something I skip in, in this version of the lesson. All right, um, so an equation. If I say something like 2x plus 6, that's not an equation. That's an expression. What do you have to have to make something an equation. It has to have a certain symbol. Yep, the equal sign. Right, you gotta have an equality symbol in there, an equal sign. Yep. So all three of these are examples of equations. Okay, they're all different kinds of equations. Um, this one in particular, it, it is an equation. But it's a contradiction. It's an equation that would never have a solution. This is an equation that is always true. 3 plus 4 equals 2 plus 5. Does anybody know what you call an equation that's always true? Uh, it begins with an I. Yep. Uh, no, that's a good good guess. No, not, not that. Anyone else have a guess? An equation that is always true. Begins with an I. A hint, you, you have one. Well, you have it in your wallet, but usually you should. Yeah? An identity, yeah. So an identity is an equation that is always true. And this is a third type of equation. This is a conditional equation. It's an equation that could be true if you pick 6 for x in this case. Okay? But these are all equations. Conditional, contradiction, identity. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to talk about reflexive, symmetric, and true. Questions on those three types of equations? <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a problem. I'm going to perform a step on the right, and on the left, I want you to tell me the reason or tell me the property that I'm using in that step. Okay. So here's my first step. property did I use to go from the top equation to the second one? Uh, yes, my name is Kyle. Distributive. Yep, that is distributive, perfect. Now the next step, uh, it doesn't really have a fancy name, it's, we'll see if you can figure out what it is. So how did I go from the second line to the third line? What did I basically do on the left-hand side? I just, yeah? Uh, you did just two times three. And what would you call doing that out? I just took it and I, I don't know the word for that. Anybody think of a word for what I did there? Yeah? Uh, multiply by property. Um, so I did multiply, and what I had now isn't as complicated. It's, it's this line is, Simplified, right? Yeah, it's just simplified. It's less complicated than the line I had before. And there's, 
there's really no fancy property. Now, in order for the left and the right side to be the same, it has to be in the same order. But I can change the order of the left-hand side. I can change 2x plus 6 to 6 plus 2x. And what allows me to switch the order? What property is that? Yep. That's the identity property? Uh, so identity would be if you like, added zero to it and you get the same answer back. So identity is when you add zero. Yeah. Is it the associated grouping because you're changing the grouping? Uh, so to change grouping, you would see parentheses in a different spot. So anytime you're dealing with grouping, you got to see parentheses somewhere. Yep. Commutative? That is the commutative. Yep. So commutative is when you take two things and you change the order. They go back and forth. Yeah, like when you go from your work to you know, your house or something. Okay, so that's an example of how you could see these three properties. I could either give you the steps and you tell me the property, or like on a test, I could do something like, you do it this way. I'll tell you the properties, and then I'll have you give me the step for that property. Okay, any questions on that? Getting into coordinate systems. So we're going to start with just a simple coordinate system. The simplest one is a number line. Okay, so on a number line, we always make sure negative numbers go to the left, positive to the right. Uh, the zero mark on the number line, we call that the origin. And once you create a number line, what a number line allows you to do is compare numbers to each other. Like I can say that the number three is to the right of negative one. Well, that, that means something about the three because it's to the right of negative one. There's four symbols that we can use when we're comparing numbers. Um, does anybody know the names of the four symbols I'm thinking of? What? It's like the less than greater than the equal to. Yep. And then I don't know the four. So you get your less than, your less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to. And together, those four symbols um, all have a name. <coughs> we get to an I. Does anybody know what? Oh, that's fine. You're good. Does anybody know what you call all those symbols? Like the group of them begins with an I. Inequalities, yep. These are called inequality symbols. <coughs> and these are the four symbols that we use when we're trying to compare one number or one thing to another thing, like on a number line. And if you already know these symbols, and you don't have to necessarily write them down. Um, there might be a lot of things today that you already know, so that's up to you. Okay. So we're going to graph something on a number line now. Uh, when you're graphing an inequality, there's two kinds of circles you can use. Um, does anybody know the two kinds of circles that I'm thinking? Yeah? Like a circle, like it's a Well, it's going to be a circle. So it's going to be in the shape of a circle, but we can either take the circle and do this to it, or just leave it and not do this to it. Yeah? Like a closed circle and open circle? Yeah, so a closed circle and an open circle, exactly. What kind of circle you use depends on the symbol in the problem. If you've got one of those symbols, greater than or less than, doesn't have the line under it, doesn't have the fill. If it has the extra line under it, the equal to, you got to do the extra step and fill in the circle. Okay, so 
so the first step um, to graphing an inequality is determining if you need an open circle or a closed circle. And the next step is shading. As long as your inequality is set up something like this, that symbol is going to tell you which way to shade. Okay? But it has to be set up like that. Letter, symbol, number. Exactly in that order. Letter, then the inequality symbol, then the number. So usually you'll see when I get an inequality that's not set up in that order, I'm going to fix it so that it is in that order. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do an example graphing on a number line right now. Yep. So I've given you two inequalities. These inequalities are exactly the same thing. This means the same thing as this. But based on what I set up above, which one of those do you think I would prefer? Uh, the one on the left or the one on the right? One on the left. Yeah, one on the left. Because if I set it up letter, symbol, number, this is going to point in the direction I need to shade. So let's worry about figuring out the circle first, then we'll do the shading. Okay, so look at your symbol. Greater than or equal to? Um, is that going to be an open circle or closed circle? Closed. Yep, closed circle. And it has to go on a certain number. In this case, what number would it go on? Number two. two. Number two. So on the test program, you usually already have the number line made. I just have to make one because I didn't have one. So we do a closed circle on the number two. And we're going to shade in every number that would satisfy being greater than or equal to the number two. So which way would I shade to get the numbers that are bigger than or equal to two? Um, we can go lower than 3, like we, we could do like 2.6, 2.3, 2.2, we can go all the way down to what number? Two. 2. So it's every number from 2 and up. That's how you would graph an inequality on a number line. So you're graphing, you're graphing the 2 with the shaped circle? What, you, what were you saying about like the right? You only you only you would do shade circle as well, but not to the left or what? Uh, well, this one is to the to the right. Uh, we're going to do one next that's to the left. Okay. Yeah. So that's to the right because it's a greater than symbol. Now we've got one that's a little bit different. Okay. Again, these two things are exactly the same. Based on what I said, do you want to use the one on the left? Or the one on the right? <coughs> yeah, you always want to set it up letter, symbol, number. And then the symbol tells you which way to shade. If you don't set it up that way, even though I wouldn't mark this wrong on a test, it's the same thing. I don't like it because it's pointing to the right, and that's not the way I'm supposed to shade. So always set it up letter, symbol, number. Number the line. So first step is deciding on the circle. Um, Alejandro, what, what kind of um, circle do we need on this one? Okay, what are our choices for the two kinds of circles? You want to help them out? We either can do, uh, yeah? Open. Open or Close. closed. This one's open. And this one's open because it's, it's the less than symbol. And right here it says for the less than symbol, you're going to use the open circle. Okay. Um, so open circle, uh, we have to decide the number, Kyle. What number does the open circle go on? Three. Yeah, they give you the number in the problem. And now we want to shade everything that is less than three. So Aiden, what, what way would I shade for the less than three? To the left. Yep, to the left. 
just like that. Okay. Any questions on that one? So using an open circle and a closed circle uh, is the way most people, I think, have seen how to, how to do it. Let me, yeah, let's get the same thing one more time. It's the same problem we just did. X is greater than or equal to 2. When you're doing it in the homework, you can do it exactly like I just showed you. But in the book, I want to show you what you'll see. Instead of a closed circle, in the book, you're going to see a bracket going to see a bracket. Um, let me see. So if you were going to graph this one the way um, they do in the book, you know it's the greater than or equal to, which means closed circle, but they use a bracket instead. So it would be a bracket on the two, shaded to the right. The bracket has to open the way you're going to shade. So in this case, the bracket is opening to the right because that's the way I'm going to shoot. Okay. So what you're looking at right there, and what we did right here, those are exactly the same thing. Now the book uses a bracket in place of a closed circle. Does anyone have a guess what symbol they use for open circle? Yeah, they use a parenthesis. So you do this exactly like we did the last one. Get your number line. We're going to put a parenthesis on the three and shade to the left. Okay, so this and this are exactly the same thing. So sometimes you're going to see an inequality has something like this. Okay, that's called a conjunction. Okay, conjunction is when you take two inequalities and you put them together. And the way you can you can kind of see it, that x is less than or equal to nine. That's that's right there. And the x is greater than or equal to 2. That is right there. One of them always has to get switched around, though, when they put them together. Okay. An and is the only inequality problem that you can take 2 and put them together as 1. You cannot do that with an or. If you're going to write an or, you have to write out the whole thing the long way. There's no short way to write an or. So let's, let's graph that one okay, and see what, what it looks like. What kind of circle uh, do you think I'm going to need on the two? Uh, open or closed? Uh, closed. Closed. What kind of circle do you think I'm going to need on the nine? Closed. Closed. So this one has two circles. Closed on the 2, closed on 9, and now the shading. I want to shade everything that's greater than or equal to 2 and less than or equal to 9. So you're just going to shade from 2 to 2 to 9? Yeah. A conjunction is like a between. Okay? It means you're going to shade between the two points. So what if I had, uh, let me just make up one more. I'm not going to graph it. 3 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 7. 
Can anybody give me the two inequalities that if I wanted to split it up and write it the long way, what would go in the first box and what would go in the second box? <coughs> yeah. And preferably, if you can keep the x on the left side in both, that would be like a half up above. Yeah. X is greater than 3. Perfect. That's that one. X is greater than 3. And? X is less than or equal to 7. Yep. So it's good to know how to take a conjunction and split it, or take something that's split and combine it. That's, that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about with inequalities today. Wait, how'd you split that one? How would you split, how did we split that? Yeah. So this one goes to that box. We just have to flip it around so the variable's on the left. So why did you flip around that one, but not the other one? Um, the other one already has the X on the left. Oh, okay, because we want the, the letter symbol. Yeah, we generally want letter symbol number. I mean, it's not wrong if you do this. It's just not something you're going to see a lot. Okay. Especially if it was like a multiple choice question on a test, I probably wouldn't write that. I'd write this top. Oh, like, what is, the, what is that saying right there? Like, this is, is saying that you need to pick a number bigger than 3 and less than or equal to 7. So you're going to pick a number between 3 and 7, but you can't pick 3. It has to be bigger than 3. So you can pick like 3.001. Okay. Any other questions on that? All right. Okay, so absolute value. Um, so absolute value basically just means how far away a number is from zero on a number line. That's it. It's a distance. Um, so since absolute value is a distance, um, what kind of number would you never have for a distance? You would never have this kind of number. Yeah? You never have a negative. Yeah. Could have zero, could have positive, but you never have a negative. So think of the number six. You had a number line and you had a dot on six. How far away is six from zero? Six units. Six units, yeah. Now if you had a dot on negative three, how far away is negative three from, from zero? Three. 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 So that's absolute value. Any question on that? So if you've got two numbers and you want to find out how far apart they are from each other, like that, that's the formula. The absolute value of A minus B. That tells you the distance between this spot and that spot. On an <coughs> right? You kind of do this thing in your head if, if you know you said the temperature this morning was like I don't know 65 degrees and now it's 80 and you want to find out how far apart those two temperatures are. You say all right well 65 minus 80 that's a difference of 15. That's basically what we're finding, how far apart are two numbers. Let's try this one. All right, so we'll set it up. And it doesn't really matter which number is A and which number is B, because you're going to take the absolute value. It's going to come out the same. So Brett, what number could I fill in right in the first spot in my absolute number? Negative 20. Negative what? 20. Oh, sorry, uh, Brett. Brett, right? James. Yeah, your James, yeah. Uh, you do two. Okay. Um, so two's not one of the numbers that we're trying to find the distance. Uh, negative two. B. 
Uh, yeah, negative two. And how about Alejandro, what number would go there? Negative nine. Negative nine. Okay. What happens when you subtract a negative number? Comes a plus. Negative two plus nine. Negative two plus nine. And what is negative two plus nine? Seven. Seven. And absolute value of seven? Seven. So that's the distance between those two numbers on, on a number line. I think that's all I'm going to talk about for absolute value. Any question on that? Okay, anything that's been new so far? So let's look at a Cartesian coordinates. Please excuse this interruption. All right, so uh, Cartesian coordinate, that's a 2D system. In a 2D system, you have two number lines. Uh, they don't call them number lines, though. Does anybody know what we call the horizontal number line? An axis? Yep, which one? <coughs> the, y. Um, the x is the horizontal. Yeah. And the vertical is, is the y. Uh, when you draw those two axes, they cross each other at a special point. Uh, does anybody remember the name of that? Yep. The origin. Origin. Um, when you draw the axes, it separates the plane into four areas. Does anybody know what we call those four areas? Uh, grid. Oh, wait, no. Quadrants. Quadrants. Yep. And if you want to specify a location on the coordinate plane. What do you use to direct someone to this spot? Yeah? Coordinate. A coordinate. Yep. I think that's it. So you've got an x and a y axis. Um, the quadrants are numbered, starting with one in the upper right, going counterclockwise. In quadrant one, all of your coordinates have a positive x and a positive y. Quadrant three, negative x, negative y, and, and so on. Okay, in a 2D system, um, the particular kind of coordinate you have is called an ordered pair. In a 3D system, the coordinate is called an ordered triple. Uh, we're not really going to do anything with 3D right now, but we're going to stick with mostly 2D. This is the graphing calculator. Yep. I think that'll be the new thing for today, probably. Good. Does everybody have that or any questions on how the XY coordinate plane works? Um, so the calculator. Um, so part of what we're going to have to do uh, whenever we use the calculator is we're going to have to set what's called our window. We might have to zoom in a little bit or zoom out. And the reason is because the calculator can only fit so much on the screen at one time. So let me show you um, an example. So you go ahead and um, turn your calculator on. The on button is in the lower left. And then in the upper right, there's, uh, I'm sorry, upper left, there's a button that says Y equals. It's above the second button. We're going to click that. And I already have something typed in there. Okay, I don't, I don't want anything typed in, so I want to clear whatever's there. Uh, and you guess what button we're going to press to clear what's there? We're going to hit the clear button. So the clear button is right below the arrows. Wait, sorry, where was that? Uh uh, in the top left, you're going to press Y equals. If you don't have a screen that looks like that, it's probably because somebody changed the settings on it. Um, does anyone's screen look a little different? We found a couple in the last class, but we, we fixed them. Okay, if you ever get really messed up, there's a way you can just reset the whole calculator. Bless you. And it will put it back the way it was when like, it was brand new. 
All right. So what I want to do is type in X. To get the X, it's the button below mode, and it's to the right of alpha. So we're going to press the X button. Then I want to press squared. The squared button is the fifth button down on the left-hand side. And then I want to do plus 10. So I want to have that typed in on the screen. That's an equation where the highest exponent is a 2. Um, does anybody remember what you call that? If the highest exponent was a 1, it would be linear. This is not linear. Linear is like y equals mx plus b. This is a step up from linear. Yep. It's what? Collinear. Uh, no, it doesn't have linear. It's a different, different word. I remember the difference is it has both pairs of roots. I remember that's the difference. Do you remember the name of that shape? I, the name of the shape is a parabola, and the name of the equation is begins with a Q. Quadratic. Quadratic. Yep. So that's a quadratic equation, which when drawn has the shape of a parabola. Yep. So what I want to do is I want to graph it. And when I don't know where to start, I press the zoom button. And I'm going to press 6. What zoom 6 is going to do is it's going to set your screen to go from negative 10 to positive 10 on the x, negative 10 to positive 10 on the y. So you press zoom 6. If you see a little yellow circle spinning in the upper right, that means it's doing something. And when the circle stops, it's done. OK, uh, where's my picture? I did type something in, x squared plus 10, so it should be showing me something. Uh, you need to go up more to I need to look up more. You're going to learn more about this, but when you add a number onto the end of a function like that, that's a vertical shift up 10. So that is a parabola that's been shifted up off the screen. So we need to fix it so we can see it. To fix it, you're going to press window. There's four numbers there that are really important. X min, max, Y min, and max. Only one of these numbers needs to be adjusted. Anybody have a guess which one we need to fix? The max. Yep. The y max. The y max. Now, what you set the y max to, well, it takes a little practice. You could try 20. Hit graph. And you'll see, a, you'll see a good picture. What you wouldn't want to do is like 20,000. Uh, you'll see something, but it's not going to look like it just did. You've gone way too high on the y-axis. And to me, it basically looks like a horizontal line. I can't even, I can't even tell what that is. So it's kind of a balance of finding what, what looks good. Uh, 20 looks good, 30. 30 would probably look fine. As long as you can see it's a U-shape, that's what we're looking for. What's these dots on mine right here? Um, so that's a scatter plot. Let me get fix that. So if somebody turned on a scatter plot, um, I'm not going to talk about that right now. But the dots are gone. Yes? Uh, my calculator is not it. It's not doing it? Uh, invalid dimensions. So that usually means, um, yeah, it's because the scatter plots are wrong. You're all set now. It should be as long as you set the window. Did you adjust your y max? Uh, You'll need to adjust that. So the, the problem some people were having were these these scatter plot things were turned on. Uh, we'll do something with the scatter plot later. It's, you can make a graph on the calculator. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Now, um, the other thing I want to show you while we're here is there is a difference between that symbol and that symbol. Okay, they're not the same. If I make it a little bigger, I think you'll see it a little clearer. See, they're not the same. One of them is a negative sign, which you use in front of a number. The other one is a subtraction sign. 
if you want to type in a subtraction problem. 6 minus 8. You use the symbol that's over with the other arithmetic lines. If you want to type in a negative number, like negative 2 plus 5, the negative symbol is the one below the 3. It won't work if you switch them. If you try to do negative 2 this way, um, it's going to give me a syntax error. Syntax error means it doesn't understand what you typed in. You use the button that it doesn't know what to, what to do with. Okay. So it'll take a little practice to get used to solving those errors. But if you ever get really stuck and you're like, the calculator just keeps giving you an error, you can reset the entire calculator. You'll lose anything that's on it. But if you press second and then the plus sign, that brings up the memory. If you go down to 7, that will reset the entire calculator okay? if, you, if you press all RAM. What that means is it's going to be like you just bought it, it's going to put it back the way it came from the, from the factory. So anything that you've done on it, programs that are on it, it's going to wipe it all out. So if I press 1 all RAM, it's going to make sure I want to do it. I don't know if you noticed the screen got a little darker. I guess when they ship it, the brightness isn't all the way up. So did I show you how to turn the brightness up yesterday? So I like to make it brighter. And that's as bright as it gets. OK, so if you ever get really stuck and the calculator is just giving you some error and you don't know what to do, you can just reset the entire thing. There's probably a simpler way, but you can always reset it. OK, let's move that. So what you might see in the book uh, is it might say to set your calculator to a viewing window or viewing rectangle. And they give you four numbers just like that. These first two numbers are the x-min and the x-max. These second two numbers are the y-min and the y-max. So if this was a question in the homework, set your calculator to a viewing rectangle and then do this, um, there's no work you have to show for this problem. It's literally just a, a practicing with the calculator. Right? And I think some people get confused by that at first because uh, it's not really a math problem. It's just, they're just telling you to go to window, type in negative 20, 20, type in negative 20, and type in 20. They're just having you practice setting a window and knowing where the buttons are to do it. <coughs> so when we go over homework and in class, I'll explain anything you want to know about the calculator that pertains to what we're learning. On a test, if it's said to do this and you're like, ah, I can't remember where the button is to set the window. Well, I'm not going to tell you how to use the calculator on the test. Okay, that's part of what I'm seeing if you learn is how to use that tool to do what we're doing. Okay. But I'll answer any questions about the calculator, not on the test. And if something weird happened on a test, like you were getting, like a couple people got an error with the scatter plot, I would fix that for you on a test, because that's something you didn't know about. So if something like that happened, then I would fix it. Okay, so any questions on that? Okay, you might, I didn't really talk about, there's some other numbers under window. There's this X scale, Y scale. Uh, I never adjust those. If you're curious what they do, it controls how many tick marks you see on the screen. So if you don't want to see a tick mark every one unit, but you want to see one every five units, now it just spaces the tick marks out more. Again, I don't really see any reason to ever do that because I never measure anything on the screen by the tick marks. It's too small. I can't, can't do that. Okay, and so last slide. So the last two formulas that we'll take a look at are the distance and the midpoint. So that is our distance formula. Um, yep, just saying. So you know.
So it might look similar to another formula. Um, does anybody recognize what this kind of looks like? Like you square something, square something, add them up and take the square root. That's part of a formula that relates to a certain shape in geometry. Yeah? Um, isn't that the same thing you do with Pythagorean theorem? That is the Pythagorean theorem, yes. It's just like a slightly different. Yeah, it, just, it looks a little bit different, but it is exactly the same thing. In order to find the distance between two points, let's call those P and Q, what you really do is you make a triangle out of it like that. You find the length of that side, and you put that right there. You find the length of that side, that goes right there. And then you're plugging in two sides and using the Pythagorean theorem to find the long side. Does anyone remember what the long side is? Hypotenuse. Yep, that's what you're really doing. This is the hypotenuse of a triangle. That's the distance formula. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole proof of it. I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. So let's try to find the distance between the points 1, 4, and, welcome, and 5, 6. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in that formula. Okay? And you guys, um, you can use a reference sheet on your tests. Okay? So if you want to make one and put formulas on it, you can. Yeah. Will that be for every test or just? Um, Yes, for you guys, it'll be for every test. You'll always be able to make a reference sheet. Okay. If you watch some of my other videos, you might hear me say like, that that class can't use a reference sheet. Um, so just make sure you look at the right videos when you're you know, checking, checking things out. Okay. But you guys can use a reference sheet. All right, so let's set up the distance formula. So there's a lot going on, so I like to do all this first. Now I've got a spot, I can just fill in all my numbers. Okay. So the first spot is x1. You have two choices what number could be x1 right now. Five or one. You could do five or you could do one. Once you decide that, then everything else has to go in a certain spot. Um, I'll do the number you said first, which was five. So that's going to be x1. Okay. Got that one. So now what's going to go 5 minus what? 6. Mm, okay, well, that's, that's y1. Uh, wait. 6 is y1. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing 1. one. So that's x2. Just the way it was set, I'm just going. Oh. Now, what about y1? Yep. Yeah. 6. 6, the way. The numbers were picked in this, whoever picked them in here. Six, and then what about the four? That goes after. That goes after, yep. Okay, so let's simplify that. Um, how about, uh, Natalie, when I do five minus one, that's going to give me how much? Four. And then when you square it? Sixteen. Sixteen. And um, Zach, when I do six minus four? Two and then square it. Um, four. Yeah. So that gives me square root of twenty. But anytime we get a square root, you always have to simplify it as much as you can. Simplify doesn't mean decimal; it just means reduce. It. If you've got a method you use for reducing roots, just do whatever you do. Um, if you don't have a method, I'll show you how I do it. I break up twenty into some something times something. And one of the numbers I pick has to be something I can take the square root of. So I wouldn't do 10 times 2. That's not going to work. Yeah? So like, would you do like 4 times 5? I would do 4 times 5. And what you are allowed to do with a square root is square root each one of those numbers separately. 4, 5. And the reason we picked 4 is because you can reduce square root of 4. What, what is the square root of 4? 2. 2. So that's what I'd be looking for when you find the distance between those two points. 2 root 5. Okay. 
Doesn't always happen. Like if you had the square root of 21, you'd have been done. You can't reduce 21. But 20, 20 you can reduce. Any question on distance formula? Okay. And the last formula is midpoint. So midpoint doesn't tell us how long something is. It gives us the location of the middle of something. It gives us a coordinate that's in the middle. Now, let's say you had two test grades. You had like an 80 and you had 100. And you want to know the grade that would be in the middle of 80 and 100. What do we call that number in math? The number that's in the middle of 80 and 100. Yeah. Like, is it in the middle or like? Yeah, like, like if you had two test grades and you wanted to find out there's a word for it. The um, average or the median? The what? Average. Yeah, it's like your average, yeah. So it's when you take, you want to find out what's exactly in the middle of two numbers, you average them. Um, so how do you average two numbers in general? You take the two numbers and what? You add them and then divide by two. You add them and you divide by two. That's exactly what the midpoint formula is. You add them and you divide by two. So the midpoint formula is the average of the x's. Add them and divide by two and then the average of the y's. Add them and divide by two. And that gives you what's right in the middle. Okay. So let's see if we can uh, finish up by finding the midpoint between negative 5, 2 and 3, 7. First thing we want to do is average the x's. So what do you get if you average negative 5 and 3 together? Negative 1. Yep, negative 1. If you add these together, you get negative 2 and then divide by 2. All right, how about if you average 2 and 7? And you can leave it as a fraction if you want. You don't have to make it a decimal. Four and a half, 4 point five. Yeah, 4.5 or just 9 over 2. Uh, either, either way. I'd say if you're going to graph it, 4.5 is an easier number to think of when you're graphing. All right, it's a lot of different stuff in that first section. Most sections don't have that much different stuff. Okay, but the first few are kind of review. Right, any questions on that? Okay. So that is the first homework assignment on page 11. So when I say 3 through 11 odd, I, I put the odd after the 11. I mean 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. And then 12, 15, 20 and 22, that's the fall. 20, 21, 22. And 28, 31, and 48. So most likely, um, we'll have a little bit of time in class tomorrow. You'll probably come, I don't know, I'm guessing your meeting's at 12.30, so you might be back here by like 1.20 or 1.30. And all we'll probably do is go over the homework tomorrow. Will we have any homework tomorrow? I, if we don't do a new lesson tomorrow, which I don't, I mean, if, they, if they cancel the class meeting, then yeah, we'll end up doing a new lesson. So I will, I will not be here tomorrow. So okay. can I email you the homework tonight or tomorrow? You can email or you could just show me Monday. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Right. But I'd say for everyone else, you'll probably be coming to class tomorrow for at least the homework. So make sure you get that done.